Of all the valuable commodities mortals will spend their gold acquiring, sometimes the most sought after prize has no weight. Every common thief has an obsession with the eye-catching glint of a finely cut jewel, or the satisfying clink of gold coins in an open waistcoat pocket. But in that regard, they are little more than magpies. Sometimes no gem nor stack of gold can rival the value of information. Just words, nothing more. Information is what wins wars. Information is the trusty weapon of politicians and diplomats who battle for power. With information, one mortal can control everyone and everything. And the most ironic part of this, at least on the continent of Tamriel, is where most people go to acquire information. To gain this invaluable resource, one must go to the poorest, filthiest slums of the city, to the domain of the vagrants. For if you really want to know something, go ask the beggars. The Thieves Guild has been known to take advantage of the beggars, who are always in the right place at the right time, dirt and rags blending into the stone structures of the city. But aside from them and the occasional bout of altruism experienced by wealthy nobles on a fleeting whim, the vagabonds quickly fade back into irrelevance, left to starve to death in the streets. So in a universe populated by a plethora of gods and immortals, all with their own quirks and spheres and areas of influence, who looks out for the nobodies? Surely they aren't godless heathens as well as impoverished scum. Well, that would be the Daedric Prince Namira. This powerful lord holds dominion over the great and ancient darkness, and when you feel the unpleasant grasp of revulsion, maybe from seeing a rat or an insect, or perhaps a corpse, well that means the Lady of Decay draws close. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. In this video I'm going to be sharing with you all there is to know about Namira, the most undesirable of the Daedric Princes. We've got princes who hold dominion over rape, enslavement, murder, nightmares and pestilence, yet it is this prince who takes the number one spot for the least deserving of worship. There really isn't much positive to be said about this prince, and contrary to the usual structure of these lore videos, I'm not even going to be playing Daedra's advocate. But I will attempt, perhaps vainly, to show the mortal realm through her lens, and offer an explanation for why anyone would be inclined to pray at her shrines. First things first, to understand why she is so undeserving of worship, we should get to know her and her sphere of influence. When you think of the Prince of Darkness, you may think of Nocturnal, the patron deity of the Thieves Guild. But her influence is more associated with the shadows, using night as a cloak to disguise one's mischief. Namira's ancient darkness on the other hand, that seems to refer more to the void, to nothingness and hopelessness. Nocturnal is affiliated with the night as darkness veils you from detection, whereas with Namira darkness is the antithesis of light, for what happens in the darkness is terrifying and best left alone. You could say that it is dark and full of terrors. She is the prince of all things disgusting and vile. This means she takes credit for the erosion of natural things, the decay and rotting of flesh, and all the scavenging insects who are drawn to the scent of death. Once again, when thinking of certain arachnids, namely spiders, you may think of Mafala. But with Mafala, spiders and web spinning is an allegory, a metaphorical representation for her sphere of lies, plots, and secrets. Namira doesn't care so much about the complex symbolism behind spiders, but rather the primal fear and repugnance it inspires in mortals. Namira is the one who truly holds dominion over the insects and arachnids. Namira is also the patron of Tamriel's cannibals, and she relishes in the consumption of mortals by mortals. In a way, this seems to be one step further than simply holding dominion over detestable things. In this, she actively encourages her followers to commit odious atrocities, and I believe this is because Namira indirectly has influence over all the dirty, repressed, baser desires of mortals. Those intrusive thoughts and fantasies some people experience that would be scorned by greater society perhaps even prosecuted on depending on the province. Those things that could never see the light of day, lest they ruin you and your reputation. Namira's all-encompassing darkness is synonymous to those hideous and shameful corners of the mortal psyche. I imagine you're starting to see what I'm talking about. 
it's pretty hard to justify any of these things. How on earth can anyone spin these truths into something worth worshipping? Namira's Realm of Oblivion and her one known artifact fit the theme pretty well too. Her Realm of Oblivion is called the Scuttling Void, and aside from the name and its role as essentially the hell in Khajiit religious teachings, very little is known of the place. I think we can safely speculate that this is one of the more frightening realms, and one you would not want to wind up visiting. Eternal Darkness the sensory deprivation of the eyes would allow the smell of rot and the sound of a million skittering insectile legs to become overwhelming. Endless lifetimes spent in a vast and empty realm of nothingness. As for her lone artifact, the Ring of Namira has had varying effects on its mortal wearer throughout recorded history, but it has always been used to inflict suffering and encourage depravity. It has been known to reflect damage upon the attacker as well as the wielder, and it is said to fuel the wearer's desire to consume the flesh of fellow mortals. What's worse is it enhances the taste and nutritional value of consuming mortal flesh, so the wearer is more inclined to regain vitality and energy from corpses rather than traditional accepted food sources. But now that we have that rather grim account of Namira out of the way, we can begin the important conversation. What makes Namira worth worshipping? I've given a good reason why many of the Daedric Princes aren't as bad as they're portrayed, but I think in this particular case it may just go the other way. I think Namira warrants the most nihilistic, unforgiving response of all the Daedra Lords, except maybe Molag Bao. But in order to condemn her, I first have to explain why people turn to her in the first place. There is a famous tale in Tamriel of a wood elf living in Valenwood during the First Era. This Bosma was named Weedle, and despite the details of the account there is no mention of Weedle's gender. All we know is that he evolves into Metapod. Weedle's tale is not a valiant one, though you can't knock their persistence. Weedle was ever the regal character. Weedle was the 13th child of a king in Valenwood, but despite their royal blood, no one cared about the 13th child. The odds of Weedle reaching the throne or even acquiring a slice of wealth was astronomically low. That made being a king's child more of a mockery than a blessing. Weedle ventured out into the world in search of individual fortune and glory, and before long Weedle stumbled upon the opportunity to be a hero. Three men were harassing a beggar, and it was escalating into inevitable violence. No one would care if a beggar wound up dead after all, but Weedle would not stand for it, and drove them away. The beggar revealed herself to be none other than the Daedric Prince Namira. Recognising her renown and her power, Weedle begged her to take them on as an apprentice. Weedle begged and begged for 33 days and 33 nights, until their voice was too harsh to continue the ceaseless chatter. At that, Namira acknowledged Weedle's plea, and stated that Weedle had passed the apprenticeship. As a reward, Weedle could choose any disease to be afflicted with, and could change it at will. The only stipulation was that the disease needed to have visible symptoms. The second reward was the power of pity. All who looked upon Weedle would feel the weight of condolence upon them, and they would always offer him a coin. The final gift was disregard. Weedle would have the notoriety of the dirt on the soles of the civilian's boots. They would forever be overlooked by everyone. Weedle was dumbfounded. How could they make a name for themselves if they were only subjected to temporary pity by some and forgotten by everyone else? To this, Namira responded, As you begged at my feet for 33 days and 33 nights, so shall you now beg for your fortune in the cities of men. Your name will become legendary among the beggars of Tamriel. The story of Weedle, the Prince of Beggars, shall be handed down throughout the generations. And she was right, for Weedle became irresistible when he begged, and the power of disregard gave great access to the secrets of the realms. People unknowingly said important things where Weedle could hear them. Weedle grew to know the comings and goings of every citizen in the city. In reference to the point I made at the very beginning of the video, about the value of information above other commodities, you can probably probably predict what my argument would be for worshipping Namira. It would go something along these lines. And the all-knowing Drew from Fudge Muppet urged the viewers to think on some obscure philosophical point he learned from watching too many YouTube videos. In this case, it would be that there are often overlooked benefits to being humble and ordinary. That Namira is misunderstood because she really does care for the underdog. She nurtures the hopeless and the mentally ill, and the outcasts shunned by greater society. But I think I'm going to cut that argument short. 
There is a lesson to be learned in the importance of going under the radar, being a fly on the wall as pretentious politicians play their power games, and being privy to all their succulent secrets, but I don't think that lesson is significant enough to justify everything else we know about Namira's values and her sphere of influence. It is true that Namira does protect the weak, the frail, the sick and the depraved, but at what cost? We see in her interactions with the Champion of Cyrodiil during the Oblivion Crisis that she wishes to guard her followers from conversion at the hands of the priests of Arche. But the final words of thanks she says to the hero are telling. She says, You have cleansed my followers' perfect darkness. The forgotten are free to wallow in their misery. And that perfectly sums up the problem. Namira only cares about outcasts, so long as they remain outcasts. All of her followers will be slaves to the darkness, indulging their depravities and feasting on mortal flesh, before the lack of sunlight causes them to experience physical and mental entropy, dooming them to gradually decompose in the shadows, becoming a feast for the cave-dwelling insects and a playground for maggots. Should one of her followers overcome their weaknesses, finding the light and making something of themselves, Namira would withdraw her blessing and her protection. Namira is the devouring mother. Her possessiveness is crippling and damning to her followers, and for that reason, I think she's undeserving of worship. I hope you enjoyed the video guys. If you did, maybe consider leaving a like. It's always immensely appreciated. Thanks so much for watching this far. I've been Drew, and I will see you next time.